long time. I, I have wondered how many emails you get a day. It's carnage. It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. I actually, it's really hard for me to put a number on it because I, I'm consistently deleting them. Yes. All, all day. Like every like, day. Like pull up your phone and are you, are you swiping out 20 emails that are just... Exactly that. Yes. Yeah, exactly that. Because it's just, it's mayhem. Mm-hmm. It's mayhem. I've got no idea how to manage it. I've got like I'm broken. Yeah, email is definitely it's definitely not inbox zero. Like I will I will say that um, to give you a rough um, let's say like my inbox right now has probably got around. I'm going to say this number, and people will be like. That sounds really manageable. But what you don't understand is like I've been into my inbox like five times today and deleted like a bunch of emails. Yes. So there's probably like 15 to 20 emails in there, which I'm going to try and get down to probably. A, I try and get somewhere near inbox zero every day. So around like I'm not lightning's not going to strike me down if I've got like three or four lingering in there. But I'm if so I just disappointed left, right now. Did you think it was going to be thousands? Yes. And I'm, and now, and it makes me feel bad about myself <laughs> because I, dude, you, you're telling me of 15. Now, listen, I know that you're going through and I'm sh- I'm sure you get so many, but I was so hoping that you'd be like, oh, I've got 300 in my inbox right now. And then that was going to make me feel better about my, if, dude, here's, if I get mine down past 100. So if I'm in the nineties, I'm like, Hey. I'm feeling all right about this. Life's great. And, and, well, no, <laughs> no, it's not. And I don't get nearly as many as you do. So, oh God, I'm just feeling convicted. I need to, I need to manage it. Can you, can you actually, from for me and for anyone listening, speak to like philosophy what? on inbox zero? Like, what even is that? Oh, uh, inbox zero. The philosophy of inbox zero is that every time you go to bed your inbox is at zero consistently every day. Yeah. So like, I'll be honest, I've never managed it. I've never, (laughs) like maybe twice in my entire life. Yeah. But it's just, yeah. If, but like for me, like, it's not that I'm, I guess I'm like quite rigorous about just deleting emails and just like foldering them. Because if I, if I look in there and there's like, oh, 30 40 emails like it, it yeah. makes me remember a time when things were out of control and i had yes. like you know thousands of emails unanswered and i was like oh what do i do so it's right. just i left that behind i can never go back again so but in terms of how many emails i get a, a day yes of, ooh, it's broken into categories right so e, so the email right. there's so yeah. like yeah email maybe 30 businessy based ones that I need to respond to. So like yes. 30, 30 a day of business ones in terms of internal Slack messages from the team, which are kind of like emails, but more, um, I guess more kind of, you tend to respond them more quickly to them. Right. So internal Slack ones, <laughs> I'm not even sure it's wild. <laughs> I don't know, like another 30 or 40 a day, probably. Sure. So, yeah. and then DMs and stuff like that on social channels. I don't really deal with that. The team deal with that, which is wicked. So maybe like me personally, I'm having to deal with around 60 to 70 messages, direct messages a day, maybe. Yes. You know, so like emails or through like the internal team comms software that we use. It's okay. It's okay. It definitely could be less. It, it, <laughs> in my perfect life, if I dream about my perfect life, they, they're not included in it, right? So, yeah. What about you? Like, <laughs> how many, oh, uh, is it, how bad is it? I mean, I, I get DM'd a lot on Instagram, and it's my own fault because I've told people, I'll get DM'd. back to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, and I actually enjoy that. I mean, there's sometimes when that feels a little bit unmanageable for me, uh, but... I, emails I struggle to I struggle to deal with. I really do. I I find that when I get an email, I just let it sit, and that's mm. not it's not healthy. It's not good. 
and if if anyone out there is like, yeah, you haven't <laughs> you haven't emailed me back, um, I find that I go through seasons of like, oh, I'm really doing well with my inbox, and then I'll have times where, boy, it's it's hard for me to manage. Um, I think if I'm honest, I think DMs are so much easier because they're lighter, they're fluffier. Maybe it's congratulatory. Yeah. Someone is saying, hey, I love the th I love the thing that you did, or or hey, or sending me some music to check out that that. I almost, I very rarely do that <laughs> because that's then an extra step, to be honest. But uh, with an email, email seems more serious, right? It's more mm. business. There's more details. There's more. Oh, so I just sort of look at those, and I sometimes you, do. You ever do you ever have this, Scott? Where like if you look at something and you know that like oh that's going to mean that I'm going to need to take all these other steps. Do you ever oh, yeah. ostrich it and like head in the sand it where you're like ah. I'll deal with that later. Or are you such just a motivated entrepreneurial crusher that you're like, I will, I will take care of this right now, and it will no longer be a problem in my life? Like, no, where are you at? <laughs> somewhere in between. <laughs> somewhere in between. Because yeah. sometimes I just have to deal with the shit. I just got to do it. Yeah. But then right. sometimes I just delete it. Like I just delete it. I, I'm, I'm just. It's. I just delete really? it. Really? I, I just delete it, yeah. Sometimes I just delete it. I'm just like, it, de it depends what it is. If if somebody wants me for something and, you know, and it's to do with a specific thing and I'm like, okay. But if it's just a random email, like a lot of the time I just delete it. Like what I, I, will, I will say that I am really great at a few communication channels and terrible at everything else. And I'm fine with that. So for instance, hmm. if anybody calls me on my phone, I'm never, ever, ever, ever gonna answer it. Ever. <laughs> ever. Really? Do, you, do ever. you hate talking on the phone? Do you do you not enjoy talking on the phone? I love talking on the phone. I just hate having like too many communication channels. So like DMs on like so if, like if I rewind a few before I kind of like really leaned into this philosophy of just do a few communication channels well. And I was just before this, like my life now, and sort of like rewind a few years, I had like Facebook, Instagram. Yeah, like Messenger yes. on Facebook, Instagram. Um, there was like, we were using Slack, which is the internal team tool. There was email, there was phone, there was carrier pigeon, I'm not sure. But you know what I mean? Like loads of different, yes. and it was just so overwhelming. And I just didn't get anything done ever. I was just always responding to everybody else, everybody else's asks, right? The, oh, can you yes. do this? Are you free for this? And I was just like, no more, no more. So if you get through to my answering machine, my answering machine says, I'm not going to check this message. It says, <laughs> hey, Scott here, I'm not going to check this message. Um, if you want to get hold of me, email, email me at, Da, 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 da. And that's what it's yes. because I'm not gonna because then I just sort of like sidestep sort of like a, a bunch of stuff, bunch of communications that I don't really want. Except my parents, obviously, if they yeah. call, they get yeah. through. Yeah, and I've got nobody's phone number um, is uh, saved. I think, nobody's phone number is saved, and it drives my friends Incredible. bonkers as well because they're like, "How do you not know my number now?" And I'm like, "I just don't save anybody's <laughs> number because that means if they phone me, I'm not going to answer." They're gonna wow. get the email me said, Email me. <laughs> now now Lisa's Lisa gets she gets a pickup, right? I mean she's getting she's, she's getting Lisa answered. gets a pickup. Lisa gets a pickup, <laughs> okay. yeah. Lisa yeah. gets a pickup. Or oh, people text me as well. And that, so I'm yeah. good on text actually. Okay. I'm good on because like all my friends so, have text and they'll si they'll sign off, you know, speak to you soon, cheers, Rob. And I like know who it is. So I'm like, yeah, 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 yes. we man. Oh te amazing. Text to phone. Okay. Let me let me ask you this, because I have a theory about the phone thing, and I wonder if this resonates for you. If you see your phone ring and you know you're not going to answer it, is it because you feel like you don't have control over the situation? This person called you, your phone is ringing. A ringing phone just always seems urgent, right? And in the past, oh, we, if the phone rings in your house, remember landlines? I mean, everyone's rushing to pick it up. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now your phone is ringing. This is not on your timeline anymore. This is on the caller's timeline yeah. you have no control so if you answer it it takes over your space right oh yeah if that's why i'm not answering not it to ever answer it, <laughs> right is that right is that is that yeah. the deal because it's it's 100%. like um you're not in control of that situation if someone texts you you get to choose right when to respond if someone emails yeah. you same 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I kind of like the asynchronous communicate. Like we do it all the time, I, don't we? We send videos. Yeah. So we, we we use like an internal communication thing called Slack, and we can video each other through there. So we send yeah. we're like pen pals, and yeah. we send each to these pen pal <laughs> videos. That yeah, are ranging from sort of like, you know, I don't know, like one minute long to 10 minutes long or sometimes 15 minutes long yeah, or whatever. Right. And our entire team uses that. So there are, yeah. like me personally, I'm just really into asynchronous communication because I think that it just gives you time to think about it. You know, yes. like really kind of like, where's my stance on this? What do I really think about this? Because it's so easy just to sort of like respond. I'm sure that you've done it. You respond and then like maybe like, a few hours Later after you like go, i'm actually not sure oh, that dude, like that's course. what i think yeah yeah of so. course yeah. oh man well that's that's fascinating because i always feel like i need to pick that call up i don't always but i always feel like oh well oh boy i should i don't know it just the phone ringing in and of itself just feels urgent and you're telling us it's not don't pick it up man just don't pick it yeah. up. Just put the put the uh, but but you'll have to if you put your email on there, you have to answer your emails, right? So you have to do the email thing. That's you, the, you uh, have to do something. Uh, yeah, yeah, but right. it, it puts a little bit more of a barrier in front of it as well. It's so easy to like call and then you're on the phone for like ten minutes or twenty minutes and then you're sort of like you've lost track of what you were doing or you're like I'm just I can't be done with that. No, 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 no. No, no, that's no, amazing. No, 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 no. no. Uh, yeah, I, I just uh, just remind me to never take it personal if I ever call you. <laughs> like now, I'll never call you. I'll oh, you, dude, you it. can call me. You can call me. You can call me. <laughs> my mom. <laughs> oh, my I brother. One of the few, dude. Yeah, my brother oh. calls me. My brother calls me. Um, yeah, I'm terrible at it, but a lot of the time, even when they call me, oh my, I shouldn't, mm. I shouldn't really say this. They already know. They already know. A lot of the time when they call me, I'm not going to answer the phone and then I'll call them back when I, when yes. it's time. Yes. Because you know? it's on. Otherwise it's, I'm like, yeah, you're in control. It's yeah. on your timetable then. Right. Yeah. Cause if I, yeah, because if I pick up, especially to my brother, that's like 20 minutes gone or maybe even half an hour of, sure, sort of, of like talking about whatever. Know. Films we're yeah. watching or whatever. I mean, it's yeah. gone, you know. So, right. yeah, I generally sort of like leave it to the evening time. And he loves to call me in the daytime as well. <laughs> You're like, bro, like, yeah, I'm working like, on building this academy. <laughs> yeah, we're like 10 years yeah. in and he's still calling me in the daytime. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think it's it's not for everybody. I, that, I would say that. Like, some people might be listening to this and thinking, what on earth are you talking about? It's rude not to pick up the phone. It, yeah, sure. Do you know what I mean? Like, all of that stuff. And that is definitely kind of true, depending on your take on it. But my take is that I just couldn't get the stuff done. All of the stuff that I want to get done and I need to get done, I wouldn't be able to get it done if I was picking up the phone and answering everybody's emails all the time and that whole thing. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. So I've got to prioritize because like emails, yeah. I heard this guy say once, he said, your inbox is a really convenient list of other people's priorities. I was like, oh, that's Ooh. great. Yeah. He said, so when you pick up that your phone on the morning and you are, you know, you open that inbox, what is actually happening is you're thinking to yourself, what can I do for all of these other people's priorities? Right. I'm going to go right. to that list, you know, and then start, you know, um, answering emails and doing that. So I definitely don't do that. I do say, I, I will say that I do open my inbox first thing in the morning, but you know what I'm going to say, right? And I start deleting stuff. Just no, start. Delete, Just... delete, delete. Yeah. <laughs> du, 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 du. And I'm like, yeah, that's better. Yeah. I'll, and, then I, right. and then I'll look at it. Yeah, I'll look at it sort of like at the end of the day. But I'm never generally going to look at my email at the beginning of the day at all, other mm. than to just delete stuff out. It's oh, noisy, man. man. Life is noisy, it's isn't it? It's so noisy. Yeah. I, I I am convicted. Today, I need to get my inbox. Uh, uh, I, I want to say zero, but I've I've never done it. I've never done that in, I, I mean, si could you just delete ever. them all? God, why can't, why, why does that scare me so much? Could, I feel like there are things in there that I need to, you know, that are like important and I'm going mean, to look I at my email and see if I could delete it all. Let me have a look. I don't think I can. Oh, jeez. I'm going to look at mine too. <laughs> just like, I can't do it, Scott. <laughs> I can't I mean, do it. Just sort of like pull the, pl um, Oh. oh, I can't. There's invoices and stuff. I can't. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, Gary. Got, there's one here from oh, Gary can, Willis. I definitely can't, can't get rid of Gary. Email, man. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely can't get rid of Gary. Oh, no, Phil, man. Can't. Oh, there's some um, team member invoices. I can't get rid of them. The team member. Oh, like, yeah. Hey, how come we didn't get paid this much? Well, <laughs> me and him. We, me and him were on a podcast, and we were like, we got carried away. Yeah. I deleted the invoice. He's so sorry. Blew it all away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian's fault. It's Ian's fault. Contact yeah. him if you're Billy in you for a complaint. It. Yeah, no, you'd be like, yeah. why, why didn't I get paid? <laughs> oh, sorry, dude. That was that podcast yeah. that we did, right? I yeah, told yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna work. I'm going to work on getting my inbox down to zero today. I can't guarantee that. I, that, I can't guarantee that I'm going to do it, but... Boy, that's some. That's actually motivating to me, man. That you, I, I thought you were gonna say fifty-seven emails, and you said fifteen, and I went shit. <laughs> no, nah, man. Like, do you know, I, like, I, I think that there's like a lot of room for me to improve as well. Like, I, I look at guys like I imagine, like, do you know, like Gary V. Like, if anybody yeah. hasn't heard of Gary V, is like a guy called Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a, um, he's done a bunch of stuff, but he's kind of like on. He's a online entrepreneur now. He's anyway, and he. Actually, no, no, that's a that's a lie. He runs a massive agency, probably the biggest uh, media uh, agency um, in in the US, and so probably the world actually. And he's got like a huge team, but he's kind of really known for just saying, "Yeah, just DM me, just email me." And he's got like yes. hundreds of millions of people following him. He's just like yes. I can remember he was notorious for like answering all everybody who tagged him on Twitter. He'd just sit yes, there. Yes, he would like, answer do, everything. Yeah. He'd answer everything. And I'm just yeah. like, oh. There's no, I mean, he's not doing it now. The, he's an animal, man. It's just he's an animal. impossible. Well. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's just yeah, he's been pretty inspirational to me. Uh, apparently not not in answering emails, though. <laughs> no, he doesn't answer an email. Yeah, yeah. I bet he answers. I bet he's got, well, he'll have an assistant. What about, yeah. should we talk about, one, on, we were talking a few weeks ago about inspiration, weren't we? And, yeah. And I guess sort of like, people that might be in like why inspiration is important is that just before we dive down that rabbit hole yeah. last week on the last podcast did we promise we'd talk about something this we week did before? and we i did. was wondering what did we talk about i was i'm glad you brought it up because i was wondering if 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 you were going to forget i didn't forget but i will say too that my an i'm not excited about my answer because i'm like i've got to have a better answer i've got to have a cooler answer i've got to have a better <gasps> answer and yeah yeah, and I just I have I have the answer, and it's the answer it's going to be, and I feel like a little self conscious about it, but it's just true for me. And because we were talking about we had homework, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We we, we were yeah. talking. If you haven't listened to last week's episode, Scott and I were talking about inspiration. We we're talking about the things, something that we could maybe recommend to each other and to all of you in terms of what helped us maybe find our voice or was really inspirational to us listening wise. I was going to be maybe in the sort of synth rock zone. Scott yeah. was going to be maybe more in the jazz M zone. Melodic minor zone. Yes. <laughs> and um, so, I, yeah, I've got something. It's, uh, but, but I bet what you do too. Well, for me, I was thinking about the the thing that really started the fascination for me around playing like electric sounds or sorry playing synth sounds on the electric bass yeah. right and doing the like making those sounds you had talked about you know like oh you felt like i was so into making sonic choices and that the tone was as important as the notes yeah, and i really do yeah. feel that way but you helped me kind of really articulate that for myself I thought, what was that? What you know? And I want to say that it was Square Pusher. I want to say that it was Aphex Twin, but it wasn't. <laughs> Is it somebody way, way, way less cool no, than those just, guys? It's, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just nerdy, but it's true. And I'm all about. I'm. I'm about <laughs> not hiding it. I want to. I want to face it forward. For me, it was Rush. Was it Rush? It was, yes. Really? Wow. And it was a period of Rush that is not as cool to like, maybe. Like, a lot of people love the early stuff, right? Up through maybe moving pictures. And then there was, like, a weird 80s period where it all kind of went sideways and all these keyboards. And then the 90s, they kind of found it again, right? Yeah. I like that weird 80s period where right. people, like, a lot of people kind of checked out. Um, Rush was, they were checking out the police. They're checking out a lot of this, like, synth music in the 80s. And there are three records in that time period that I think are masterful. Um, Grace Under Pressure, 
Power Windows, and Hold Your Fire. Of those three, the red one with the three balls on it, it's called Hold Your Fire. It was so inspirational to me because there's this low-end concept on that record. Getty is playing these ferocious, amazing bass lines. And then there'll be moments, maybe a chorus, where it just drops into these subterranean sub-bass pads on Moog. And oh, because he plays the pedals as well, doesn't he? Was he yeah, playing maybe he's feet? doing it yeah. with Taurus pedals, yes. Yeah. But then when he does that stuff, he moves into like keyboard zone. So it's this duality. It's not like he's not always playing electric bass with his hands and then stepping on Taurus pedals for bottom. When he steps into synth territory, it moves, it like changes the whole atmosphere of the tune. And I just never... I just didn't think, A, that you could do that. Like, it was sort of yeah. rule-breaking to me. And B, it just gave a song so much more width and depth sonically that it all of a sudden just changed. And it was really inspirational to me. I mean, big time. Those records, but specifically Hold Your Fire. And there are a lot of Rush fans out there that are going to be, you know, like, ah, oh, it's the cheap. They'll be like, no, that record. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's the worst. But that's, I mean, boy, that was a big, big deal for me in kind of like thinking about sound more as cinematic and building scenes instead of like, oh, playing the sick riff through the whole tune. And yeah. well, it's like, no, what do we want the chorus to feel like? Maybe it's going to go and widen out. Um, what tracks just, do you think people should check out if, if you know, if they want to check out this album with the three red balls on? I can't remember the name, yeah. sorry, but I could definitely remember the three red balls. <laughs> it's a great album cover. It's a great album cover of mine. It's a classic album cover. Uh, yeah, the album's called Hold Your Fire. The tunes to check out are Lock and Key, Prime Mover. Uh, I'm going to say Turn the Page. I also want to say Time Stands Still. And the first track as well is Killing, called Force 10. I'm pumped that I remembered five tracks <laughs> off of the Rush record with the three balls on it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> like, a, what kind those, of effects was tracks. he using? What, what effects was he using? Other than the, the Moog stuff, like, was he using stuff on Well, see, here's the thing. Getty, Getty was never using effects. Um, I mean, he always had some grind on the bass, hmm. but he was never, like, a, an effect pedals guy. Oh. Um, I, just, I just was into that stuff before I was really actively thinking about sounds. And for me... The keyboard thing was not accessible. I was like, I don't, I just wanted to make those sounds. So I just found it through pedals. Like I would buy a pedal and I would oh, play, you know, an octave pedal yeah. and I would play and I would think, oh, that kind of sounds like the beginning of Tom Sawyer or that kind of yeah. sounds like the breakdown in subdivisions or whatever. I mean, I'm a huge, I'm a huge Rush nerd. It just uh, really was like the first music that sort of expanded my my tiny mind, you know, um, oh, in, yeah, in the rock yeah. space. Yeah. So have you got? Yeah. So yes, yeah, so you got the octave thing, like the octave pedal. Like, what were your first three pedals? Well, the first pedal I bought was a was a Ibanez multi effect thing. It had compression, EQ, and chorus, and it was three pedals on a on a what switch. What was it called? Oh, what I wish I, dude, I wish I remembered. It was three. Uh, I would have to look, and and honestly, it didn't. I wasn't really into it because. Compression, I had no idea how to use that when I was 13. An EQ, I, yeah, may, maybe I'm sliding the sliders around. I'm like, oh, is it like the car stereo? And then the chorus, too, didn't sound very good. And I was kind of like, ah, pedals, whatever. But truly, was it, the was first it a pedal. V, was it a UE300? Maybe. Do, is it black and pink or black no, and it's purple? A, it's gold. It's gold. Oh, there's a black and purple one here, but that's got yeah. a few more. It's got a few more. Oh, maybe that's, that's got a few more things. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't have a name on that. Yeah, just love I'll these old it. vintage pedals that, yeah, that sort of like that are our vintage. Do you know what I mean? Because yes. it's like legit, kind of like I read something the other day. Let me just read you this. I kind yeah, of please. Like, oh sh It was like an oh shit moment. Yeah, Let please. Put my photos. I took a screenshot of it. Oh, this, oh god. Just talking about old pedals. Did you yeah, know? Please. Check this out. Did you know that 1980 and 2021. Okay, 1980 and 2021 yeah. oh, no. are as far apart 
as 1980 and 1939. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. What? That's, those, are ter- those are terrible numbers that I don't even want to think about, Scott Devine. What? <laughs> See, it's incredible, isn't it? I was like, oh. That means we're. I didn't even. I couldn't even. Yeah, I couldn't even compute. I was like, no way. 1939 to 1980 is just. Yeah. It's just like Brutal. different worlds, isn't it? Same. It's like 1980 to 2021. Anyway, vintage pedals. Vintage uh, that's old, old bass dads trying to rekindle the nostalgia, looking up the Ibanez bass pedals. <laughs> I, honestly, though, that Ibanez bass pedal, I think I ditched that. My, the first pedal that was really that I sat in a music store and played and was like, whoa, was an octave pedal, and it was the EBS, the first edition of that. Oh, the EBS, EBS yeah, pedal, yeah. Yeah, it was on clearance at a at a music store, Jones Music, Kalispell, Montana, where I grew up. I plugged it in, and immediately I was like, "Whoa!" I could sound like that Getty Taurus pedal thing just by only turning the octave signal on. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I could sound like Tony Levin, you know, on Peter Gabriel records when you blend the two signals together, and yeah, those were yeah. huge. You know, Gabriel and Rush at the time for me, big, big. Big influence. So what other I was, stuff did you have going on at that time? Like, what are the most embarrassing? Do you know when you were like, when you talked like about music? Rush, you, you were like, that was the thing that opened your mind. Yeah. Yes. What other stuff Bef- was going on at that time? Dude, before that, hair metal. Hair I metal. Lo- yeah. Yes. I loved Warrant, Winger, Def Leppard, Firehouse, Rat, Tesla, all of those bands. Love it. Because yeah. part of it, I had a babysitter. My sister is eight years younger than I. So we had this babysitter that would come around who wasn't that much older than I was. She was probably 15. I was 10, 11. She would turn on MTV and I would be like, these guys look like girls. And she'd be like, yeah, it's cool. And I'm like, oh. And I was in love with her. Love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was yeah. in love with her. So I was in love with that music then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You were like, come on, Def Leppard. I, I was a massive Def Leppard fan back Were you really? Huge. Mutt Lang. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, Mutt Lang. I mean, like that yeah. production style. Obviously, that was. I, I, when I think about Def Leppard, I instantly think about like Brian Adams. Do you know what I mean? Because yes, Mutt sure. Lang did the Brian Adams thing, and then he obviously did yes. Shania Twain's thing as well. All of that, you know. Anyway, rabbit hole. But yeah, I was really into really into Def Leppard, really into Extreme. Do you know Extreme? Oh, of course. Nuno Betancourt and yes, oh, they were Gary amazing. Sharon. What a great band. What a great <laughs> band. Three sides to every story. Like Incredible. It's like a yeah. concept album. It's bonk. I listened to that. And they were in their early 20s when they wrote it. I was just like, yeah. how did they do this? And that, was it before Pro Tools? What? Oh, for sure. Oh. Yeah, for sure it was. Bonkers. Yeah, I know. So cool. That's when you had to play. Look, look at us. I mean, you know, I was about to go down this thing of like, that's when players really had to play. <laughs> but, it's, but it's true. It's true too, though. You know, because yeah, you couldn't just chop it all up and quantize it to the grid. Those yeah. bands were ferocious. Um, but yeah, I, then then I had then I I sort of moved away from it, and then I tried to hide it for years and years and years. Like, oh, I I, I never liked that because it's sort of embarrassing. But I. I absolutely love that era of music. I really, yeah. really do. And I think there's some really incredible things. <laughs> I think you were just more socially dialed in than me. Like, I just was... I, I've got, like, I don't know, like, really funny memories of me turning up to... So, like, all my friends were, like, into Nirvana and Pearl Jam and the whole yes. Seattle scene. Yeah. You know, like, Pumpkins, obviously, like... I love the yeah. pumpkins though, like Smashing Pumpkins, one of my fav- one of my yeah most favorite bands ever. But anyway, yeah. I've got these hilarious memories of me turning up with my Gary Willis VHS and sitting down <laughs> in this sort of yes. like it's in room full of like ten to fifteen like Nirvana Pearl Jam dudes, uh, Blind Lem, I mean like all of that, and then sticking on my Gary, just like totally. Yes. Socially unplugged. I'm just like, you will watch this and you will enjoy it. I'm like rewinding it. I'm like, check it, check that out. Check like, come it. on, guys. Tribal tech, right? Kirk Co- Covington. Yeah. Come on, guys. Kirk Covington on Kit. And like, <laughs> they must have just been thinking, who is this lunatic? And it, yes. yeah, I even used to do it. If we'd go out to nightclubs and stuff 
And, and if I'd had, you know, a few too many beers, that, that yeah. Gary Willis VHS was coming out and my friends. Had, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I used to, I left at his house. I used to get it out. You know, we'd watch. It was a mix of the Smashing Pumpkins and Gary Willis. It was a strange, That is strange. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love the idea of you just having that VHS, like, with you. And, and like, the, the boys times, are like, yeah. oh, no, man. Like, Divine. Like, if he has another drink, man, he's going to bust out the Gary he's Willis, gonna, you know. He's going to bust out the Willis jazz <laughs> Exactly, <concepts>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I seriously did that. I seriously did that. Oh. It was amazing. I, I I thought they liked it, but yeah, they, <laughs> like, I think they probably just hated me. They were probably just like, oh. what, what? You know, yeah. listen, if they Humoring liked it, me. maybe they liked it on the merit of, of Gary Willis and Tribal Tech, but they also, maybe they just really liked you, Scott. You know what I maybe, mean? Maybe. That's really maybe. cool. I think the that's music cool that they didn't just pull just, that thing out. Yeah, you know? that's true. I think the music was just too bonkers that they probably didn't even know what it was. Therefore, was just like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? I mean, it's like, pretty cool. Yeah, I Drummer looks like he's enjoying himself. Oh, it's so great, oh. so great that VHS. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, but so uh, well, it was well, rushed before, for you. It was rushed, and so now, of course, I I want to know what it was for you. What what can you recommend to get your your Thoughts around jazz vocabulary together. Okay, well, for me, it was like my particular, I guess, what I love about the particular harmony I enjoy playing is kind of like a lot of melodic minor bass stuff. So, but I was in exactly the same boat as you in that I learned a melodic minor and I was like, well, this just sounds weird. It's like a, yes. it's like a, it's like a major scale gone wrong. Do you know what I mean? And for anybody that doesn't <laughs> yes, exactly. know. exactly. Yeah, exactly. A melodic minor scale is a, exactly the same as a major scale with a flat third. Go play it if you haven't. It will sound weird. And it sounded yes. weird for me for years. I just couldn't get it. I told you last week I was like, I was at Gary Willis's flat and... And we were talking, I was like, so I just don't get this melodic minor thing. Because at the time I was living in Leeds, hanging out with a bunch of musos, you know, a bunch of sax players and keys players. Everybody's talking about melodic minor. I'm like, yeah. what the, this weird scale. So I went to Willis's place out in Barcelona and Willis is like, eh, yeah, I don't, I don't use it at all. It just sounds weird to me. And I was like, oh, no, no shit. Said, okay, so I won't use it. So I really forgot about it for yeah. a long time. And uh, until I started, it's just sort of like a musical development thing, isn't it? The reason why I picked up the bass in the first place was actually because I heard a solo called Low Levels. Hi Let me just check. It's called, I don't want to. Oh, look, yeah. Because somebody, <clears throat> I'll go and check this out. Yeah. Low Is Levels. It, there's a couple people listening to this podcast now, Divine. Yeah. You know that. Exactly. Oh, okay, so it's Low Levels, High Stakes. And it's a track by Alan Holsworth, recorded in 1993. And the bass player is Schooly Sverison, an Icelandic oh, yes. guy who's just <clears throat> a monster player. He was at Berkeley the same time that Matt Garrison was at Berkeley and Chris Tarry. Remember Chris Tarry? What a, what a no. player he was. Oh, great, great player. He was a great player based, up in, um, based over in Canada, was one of the first... Maybe even, do you know, we were talking last week or maybe the week before about Yannick being sort of like one of the first yes. um, pioneers of uh, using online as a vehicle to promote his music. I was Dalla, yeah. Yeah, Yannick was Dalla. Yeah. Chris yep. Terry might have been before him. Really? He was like really early on. Yeah, really early on. And so Chris was also at, at college with great player. And he actually, just side note, he runs a massive podcast network now so he's actually got his i think that i'm going to tell lies right now but he doesn't work he does work professionally as a bass player but he's got this whole like a really popular i think it's children podcast network where they write stories and they're published on podcasts or something like that like it's massive wow a friend of yeah like it's, it's ginormous like it's a ginormous thing that he's got going on which is really cool actually when i found out about it because you know i don't know i just kind of like it when i hear that these amazing musicians, because he was like world class, had also got this other career going on that he yeah. was also really great at because he was a really fantastic fiction writer as well. Anyway, I digress. Wow. So that's cool. Yeah, it is very cool. Check him out, Chris Tarry. 
okay. bass player. Super cool. Anyway, so Scully Ferrison playing on low levels, high stakes. The first time I heard that, I was living in Carlisle. I was like 17 years old, maybe 16, 17 years old. Heard that solo. And the harmony that he was using in that solo, I was just like, what is that? It was just really fascinating from a just the tension of the lines and everything i was just like what i was just so great so anyway picked up the bass and then years later um was actually i, I sat like i actually got to hang out with school and got a few lessons from him as well but anyway mm. um sat down with that solo and really started to figure it out like i tried to you know break the back of it before but it was just such a beast yeah. But anyway, so like I sat down. This is maybe in my t like in my like well into my twenties. Maybe when I was like twenty three or twenty four. Uh, yeah, maybe twenty three. I sat down, started working out that solo, and lo and behold, all of the stuff that I'd really liked the sound of that I'd heard back when I was sixteen, seventeen. A lot of it was this melodic minor stuff, and I was like, oh, and listening to somebody use that that scale in context, I suddenly started to hear it and I was like, oh, I get it, I get it. So yes. learn bits of that that <clears throat> solo. I didn't learn all of it because I would have been, you know, there until sort of like, you know, I don't know, until I died because it's like the, <laughs> the most complex <laughs> yes. solo of all time. But learned all of the bits that really resonated for me from, an, um, from a sort of like tension and line perspective. Mm -hmm. um, got those, if anybody can hear that, there's a helicopter going over. Um, got that <laughs> down realized it was this melodic minor stuff that I'd just not been used, using before. So everybody go check out that solo, by the way. Low levels, high stakes, it's on YouTube. Um, with It's from Alan Holsworth. And um, so it's like a ballad thing. Um, worked out that it was oh, using this melodic minor stuff. But then I'd like learned these licks, but I couldn't really use them yet. I was like, okay, but now how do I use it? It yeah, how do you music. apply? Right. How do exactly how do I apply it? So then I went on this down like a rabbit hole of trying to find somebody that was teaching like a lot of this melodic minor stuff. So I could basically just like learn it, right? And I found yes. some YouTube videos by a guy called John Stoll, which it's a guitar player. John Stoll. I'm writing John, all this right? down. John Stoll. It's S T O W E double -L, L. And John Stoll has got all of these really cool, there's some on YouTube, I think he does some on his site maybe, but there's bunches of like books and stuff. There's a bunch of materials of him talking about how to apply the melodic minor to, to just to chords, right? Like how to, if it's a D minor seven, but you can also play a D melodic minor over it, even though it's got that one mm. wrong note, you can add his attention note and stuff like that. So I just went down this crazy John Stoll um rabbit hole for honestly like two years just just learning as much stuff and consuming as much material of his as i possibly could so if anybody's seen me teaching any of any of the melodic minor stuff that i've got any of it it's just comes from directly from john still all of it so any sort of like over two five one, when you get to that five chord, you can use a melodic minor up a semitone. You can use that melodic minor up a fifth. You can use it down a um, tone from the root. You can use it from the fourth. So over like a G seven, you could use A flat melodic minor, D melodic minor, F melodic minor, C melodic minor. You could even probably use B flat melodic in a minor in a cheeky way. So all of that stuff just came directly from John Stoll. And I got that and practiced the utter living heck out of it. And that is where all my kind of lines come from, really. That, that, that you know, I guess that um, really in-depth period of studying John's stuff. Now, I will say that I don't particularly play any of his lines at all. It was just the sort of like the... The uh, so if I, Yeah, if anybody listens to John Stoll, it doesn't, listen, it doesn't sound anything like me at all. Um, he's just so, so incredible. But it was, just the, it was just the concepts. It was just the concepts, yeah. How long did it take you for that vocabulary to start to feel like you owned it or like it was part of your vocabulary and there was fluency in it? Um, yeah, probably three to six months. It yeah. takes a while for me. I'm like, a, right. I am, I'm a slow learner. 
I am. I am like, too. I'm a slow. I, I, I kind too. of I, and I, and I forget a load of things as well. Like I'm not sure, about, I just forget like pretty much everything. Like, <laughs> but uh, in terms of playing, you know, like I'll, I'll find something cool and they'll be like, "What was that cool thing that I had the other day?" But um, but yeah, it was like three to three to six months, and I think that um, I think to really absorb something like that into like your everyday vocabulary, I think it just takes that long, doesn't it, to really... Because f- at first, it's just a lick. You learn a lick. Exactly. That's based on a scale, isn't it? You you right. learn a lick, it's based on a scale. Then you need to get that sound into your ear so you fully can understand it from that perspective and you can hear it. And then you need to get that lick and take it and, you know, kind of mould it into different phrases and different approaches yes. and that whole thing. So... That takes a while. It does for me anyway. And uh, and then you're trying to use it in context. So for me, like if anybody's interested, the, the way that I really kind of got it under my fingers to begin with is practicing it over two five ones. Just, just yeah. practicing it like, yeah, just over two five ones. Every time it's a five chord, trying a different, um, different substitution. So getting really used to that, playing that melodic minor scale up a semitone from the root. Probably did that for... <laughs> you know I mean, like a good, good few months, you know, just getting that down and then moving on and then just experimenting. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's long. It takes a long while. And I think that everybody, when they're trying to absorb vocabulary like that, you kind of need to set your expectations because it's so easy to kind of like learn the thing and then not yes. really put the work into absorb it into your playing. And then suddenly you spent, you know, a week, two weeks doing it. And then it's lost and it's gone until next time, until it comes back around. So, yeah. And everybody, that's why you're listening to the Scott and Ian show. You got the lowbrow guy talking about, ah, listen to Rush. <laughs> listen to how those low notes make the thing sound different. <laughs> and then you got Divine, then you got Divine going, it's going to take three to six months to get your melodic minor concept together. <laughs> I recommend these resources. Here are the bullet points for the resources. <laughs> and it's so good, dude. I love it. I, I was writing this stuff down, man. I'm going to go check it out because I need that in my playing. I need another challenge. I need, I have been playing the same, you know, pentatonic basic lines my entire life. So I need like it's it's time for me to get in the shit. <laughs> I think it's, I yeah, it. I think it's just it's hard, and I think the challenge is finding a way to because people everybody's different, right? The way they practice, like I'm completely different. I, yeah, have we talked about practice before? I don't know that we have. I don't think we have actually. We should probably just you know segue into practice off the back of this. But, <laughs> but I Let's I pra- yeah I practice a certain way. I just. You know, and I'll get in. It's 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 pretty. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty. You know, pretty strict. And um, <laughs> and, and you and you don't right. So, which you're like loose, and you're sort of like, and, and you go up into your loft and you chill and go into <laughs> yeah. the early hours of the morning, just sort of yes. like just vibing and and getting the thing. And I wish I could do that. Honestly, I wish I could do that because like. Sometimes mine's a little self harmy right? But um, but I think the challenge for people is is finding their particular style of practice, right? Getting real yes. comfortable with it, and then learning how to take stuff like that, like we're talking right now. Like, how do you get that melodic minor thing, and then plug it into your style of practice? Like, and that's yeah. I think because it's not my my thing won't work for everybody because I'm me and they're them, right? So like for me, I'm like I'm Mister Notebook. I'm Mr. Organized. I used to write down every single thing I was practicing. Keeping a practice log. Dude. Dude. Yeah. Dude. Tomes and tomes. Out of control. The scrolls, dude. Out come the scrolls. (laughs) Yeah. Out of control. I used to practice how how much I used to practice. I used to time it. Um, I used to, like, divide my practice time across different categories. So I was you know, really diversifying what I was working on. Um, so I'd work on, like, fingerboard knowledge, and then I'd, I'd work on soloing and improv- improvisation, and then I'd work on, like, groove creation and time. And I'd do this every single day. And Incredible. I was, like, a How long would you do it? it? Like, like, in your heyday of practice, what did what did that look like for you? Okay, so, yeah, I think that this is really interesting, and I think that... Um, 
a lot of the people that I've talked about have this experience. Do you know when people are like, I used to practice eight hours a day? There was yes. periods in my life, but they were only short periods. This is the interesting yeah. thing. Where I just played all day. Right. All day. I just used to wake up probably late because I didn't have any kids and stuff like that and no one. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd probably pick up my bass about 11 in the morning and then I would just play it all day at home. Just like, do just whatever. But I'd play it all day and maybe it'd get to like 8 o'clock in the evening. I'd stick on a film and then I'd play my bass while watching the film. So it was just... Yes. And I think that that's where that... You, you, uh, the, I mean, people practice eight hours a day. I don't think it's, well, at least not necessarily the people that I know. They weren't sort of like, you know, I will practice eight hours a day. They were more like, they were just enjoying playing and just yeah, sitting there having all it day. in their hands. Yeah, just sitting yeah. there all day eating cereal and playing bass, <laughs> you know. Oh, it sounds like a delightful time. Oh, it was good. So <laughs> I used to does. do, I, I, I went through two periods of my life when I was like a, a bit of a maniac around practicing. Mm. Um, where it was like an all-day affair. And, and one of them got really serious, probably too serious. One of them, I actually started um, sleeping in the daytime and practicing through the night because wow. for whatever reason, oh, yeah, I don't know, like mental illness is a weird thing, right? But, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was sleeping in the day. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to be able to focus more and get a deeper practice, deeper practice sessions done if I actually just do it through the night because nobody's gonna, you know, pester me or interfere with me. So I was sleeping in the daytime and practicing all night, and that's yeah. And I can remember that ended. I was going out with a girl at the time, and and we went to the pub. <laughs> to meet, we, we went to the pub and uh, to meet her friends. And this was sort of like several, maybe like a two or three months into doing this, went to the pub yeah. for some pints. And I and I realized I'd turned myself into a social moron. It was mm. I, so I didn't. It was so weird. I'd gone. I'd, I was living this kind of sort of like reclusive life where I was <laughs> yes, like you're fit, hermit. Pra yeah, practicing <laughs> all night long, yeah, sleeping right. all day long, not really speaking oh. to anybody. And it only right. went on for a few months. And then I can remember being in the pub with uh, with Mary's friends and like looking around, and I was like, oh, I've messed up. I felt like really like weird anxiety. I didn't yeah. know what to speak about because I'd not <laughs> done anything for like a, a, I mean, like I just like completely just like, clused myself. Hey, ladies, does anyone talk, want to talk about yeah, melodic minor yeah. concepts? Like, I can mem <laughs> yeah, I, like I got in the taxi. I was going home with Mary and uh, to our to our house that we were living at the time. I was like. Uh, I think that's the end of the like the nighttime practice session thing. I was like, and, and she was like, "What do you mean?" And she, I was like, I, "I really find it hard to speak to anybody." So yeah, that was the end of that. <laughs> but yeah, and that's well, a, good that's for you bad though. Good got. for you. I mean, good for you for realizing that it was a problem. Because I feel like when a lot of people get to the zone where they've flip-flopped night and day and they're just working on their craft, I mean, there are a few musicians that come to mind for me of like, they have to practice every day no matter where they are in the world. You know, like Virgil Donati, drummer, has like this insane practice regimen. And I just sort of think, to be honest, honest i don't think that that's healthy or wise no i, I don't think it is at all i think it could i mean a, well, a period of it right a, a period think it, of it yeah. maybe yeah yeah periods of it it was, it was still maybe a little unhealthy i'm not sure like i'm a real obsessive kind of guy so I, yeah so and i think that comes with the ability it gives me sort of like crazy focus and um and a need to do, I was going to say motivation, but it's not really motivation. It's like a need to do the thing, you know, yeah. and it can be pointed at bad stuff or it can be pointed at, pointed at good stuff. Sure. So like Lisa, for instance, my wife, she's always like, she helps me point it at good stuff, you know. That's good. It, yeah, because it could be. So for instance, just a, a simple one is that I drink way too much coffee at the minute every day. But it's sort of like this weird, like I've got to do it. It's sort of like this weird kind of like repetitive like behavior that I get into. It's it's just I'm a bit of a weird in this habit. Yeah, and I just can't get out of it. Yeah. So I don't know, like just wait there. Yeah. Wait a minute. Oh man. Oh I gotta see. 
If, if anyone is listening to the podcast and not watching, Scott Devine has pulled out now four Keep strange going. cartons. This is iced coffee, dude. Is there a fifth? Two more. Fifth. More. Six. More. Seven. More. So I've got eight. 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 No. That's like how is that like two liters of coffee? I don't know. Oh, like we are many, all coffees? judging you so hard know, right now, three, Divine. Three. There's a lot. There's a lot. So there's like eight <laughs> coffees here. Like a large proportion of these were done today. So it's oh. yeah. So I've got that thing going on. It, it's a superpower, <laughs> dude. It's a superpower sometimes. It just comes with its downsides. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we've, just got to point it, we've just got to point at the right stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I am also a I am also a coffee addict. Actually, I I don't drink. I don't know if you know that about me, but I don't drink. I've never smoked anything in my life. I've never even you don't smoked drink a cigarette. Alcohol. I don't drink alcohol. Yeah. Oh, every my, Saturday I night, up... dude. I I drink all of the alcohol for you. It's all right. <laughs> you sleep you're easy for both of us. Yeah, sleep easy, man. <laughs> sleep easy every Saturday night. You know. Oh. <laughs> I grew up in a family of alcoholics and I also grew up in kind of like a cowboy town or you know like a small town in Montana and just the the people I was around it, it wasn't um appealing to me like I didn't got it I sort of fell into music and started to play rush tunes in my room for you know hours on end yeah while the while the other guys were going out and getting you know like hammered at the at the bonfire um yeah. and Part of that probably wasn't healthy because I was a base recluse as well. Um, but yeah, I, it's so weird, man. At, then at every milestone, um, people have said to me, oh, well, when you go to high school, you're going to drink, certainly. Oh, well, when you go to college, you're going to, oh, you're studying abroad in the UK and Scotland? Well, of course you're going to. And at yeah. every point, I've sort of, sort of felt like, hmm, no. Have you, ever, have you ever drank? Have you had to have a, have I you mean, had I've had tastes. Of things, right? Um, like I'm not a like I'm not a psychopath. I've, I've like tasted a beer before, but yeah, where yeah. I draw the line, and like it, like my wife will get a drink, like she drinks like a normal person, um, yeah. and she will get something, and she'll say, "Oh, you might really like the taste of this. Do you want to try it?" And I'll say, "Sure," and I'll have a sip. But where I draw the line is having my own drink. Like I will Got never carry it. around a beer. And it's yeah. just, I don't know, dude. I've always been that way. I've never smoked a cigarette. Isn't that lame? I've, I've smoked I mean... all the cigarettes for you. <laughs> <laughs> I've drank all the drinks. So, Actually, just yeah. before I incriminate myself, every Saturday, <laughs> I just have a bottle of wine. I have a yeah. bottle of wine. It's what I do. It's my Saturday ritual. I sit down. It's like, ha. Ah. Yeah, Lisa and I, we sit down. I've got my bottle of wine. It's been chilled in the, yeah. It's just, yeah, that's, yes. my, that's my thing. And uh, but Sounds yeah, like amazing. I have definitely I have smoked a lot of cigarettes. That that went on for a while, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh god, that was brutal. Actually, you, you did great not to do the cigarette thing because it's, well, it's a pain in the ass I, to stop. Actually, I don't know why, but it's true. I but that then has led to other things, right? So I struggle with food stuff. I struggle with coffee. I also I, I started to tell the story um, to say that I am also a coffee addict. I drink a lot of coffee. I don't drink the cartons. What the hell are those that you were showing Ice me? Coffee. That's some Ice coffee. That's some that's some British carton coffee going on right there. It's dude. like the um you get it in the Oh, what's that? You know the oh, they do it in like well, they do it in New York. Um I think it's like a big glass, like a growler. It's like a no. It's like you, you you actually like we sell. It's the same stuff that they, they they actually do it down our supermarket as well. But I'm banned from I'm banned from buying it because it comes in a big bottle. And basically, <laughs> if I buy the big bottle, I just drink it all in one day. And Lisa's like, you cannot drink that much coffee. I'm like, I right. just did. She's like, that's the point. Yeah. You cannot buy any big coffee. So I'm banned from the big bottles. I need the little. So bottles. you're just buying a thousand little ones. Incredible. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm going to I'm going to quit. I'm a, I'm gonna quit. I'm I'm gonna quit. I have to. It's driving Lisa around the bend, man. She's she's like, this is yeah. She really she thinks I'm killing myself. I'm like, dude, it could okay. be cigarettes, you know. She's like, yeah, that's true. It could be worse, right? How okay? Talk to me about this then. How late are you drinking coffee? Into the like, are you just drinking coffee in the morning like a normal person? Like, even though it's a lot of coffee, is it in the morning or is it all through the day? 
it's concentrated into the morning. It's like, yeah, it's definitely yes. concentrating in the morning. And um, maybe like latest two o'clock in the afternoon. All right. Because if I have well, a, even a sniff of coffee yes. at like yes. three, I just can't freaking sleep, man. It's right. awful. Welcome to... Well, then let me <laughs> let me help you feel better about yourself and oh, about your coffee addiction because I drink a bunch of coffee in the morning and then I put coffee into a thermos that keeps it warm and then I carry that around with me wherever I go in a backpack or whatever and yeah. I drink it until midnight. <gasps> <laughs> Does that not screw you over when it comes to getting to sleep? I mean, probably. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you've seen me. You've seen me. Uh, you know, working on things or checking on things or submitting videos or whatever at two or three a.m. when it's your morning yeah. and my very late night. That probably has something to do with my caffeine intake. But, dude, I mean, I, I'm the guy at the end of the gig when I'm packing up before we go home. You know, play a wedding or something, right? I'm, yeah. Whoosh, whoosh, out comes that bottle, and I no. take a huge swig of coffee, and people look at me like I've just arrived from the moon. And I say, and, and then for a long time, I didn't even realize that it was weird. <laughs> Amazing! I love that if you were drink if you were drinking a massive beer, nobody would like bat an yeah. eyelid. But because it's like a massive coffee, people are like, "Who is this fella? Who is this guy?" <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, then then I get into my practice regimen late night of you know I'm probably buzzing a little on coffee and I I do my that's thing. why you're up really late. Right? Yeah, you maybe practicing? tell people tell people that don't know like how you practice because I think that's quite. I mean, let's, let's I both think, do that. Like, because I've got yes. sort of like what I've what I do now as well. I think it might be cool if we share kind of sort of like at the minute how we're practicing and and all that stuff. I would love so that. People can check it I, out. Yeah. I think. I mean, you're probably going to have a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> as you do a lot more concrete ah, stuff for people to dig into i have i have conceptually i've changed the way i've thought about practice recently and it's something that i've talked to you about and i've even talked to the team about or like you shared that with the team um but i'm not all like when i sit down to really do a focused session um i try to do a short burst of uh, concentrated work. So what I will try to do is I will sit down for a 45 minute session. And this is not when I'm watching YouTube videos and eating Doritos and, and slamming <laughs> coffees at midnight, you know, like that's a different, <laughs> that's a different thing. If I'm going to sit down to practice, this actually makes me feel really good. I do a 45 minute session. I divide it into three things. The first 15, I am only doing timekeeping and I'm doing slow, slow metronome work. Like the click is here. And I'm playing boom, boom, working on whole notes, then working on halves, then quarters, eight sixteens. And I close my eyes and I really, I imagine, check this out. <laughs> this is weird, but it's true. I imagine that the beat is a big ball of butter and it's in front of me. Yeah. And I am going to cut the beat right down the center with a hot knife. I imagine that, <laughs> visualize that. I wanna get yeah. right inside of the note. So it starts as sort of like, honestly, like a Zen practice for me, almost, almost like a meditation. Yeah. And then yeah. I feel really good and warm and kind of relaxed after 15 minutes of that work. And I'm not going zig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig. I'm not playing Rocco 16ths. I'm playing slow yeah. notes. Then I'm working on some kind of conceptual um, or theoretical concept that I need work on. Maybe it's harmonic minor. Maybe it's melodic minor. <laughs> Although it's probably not because I, I feel very uncomfortable with those things. But I'm but I'm running through maybe a fingering of a two octave mode shape, right? Something that I feel like ah, I need to understand this a little better. Lately, it's been Andres uh, with playing through triads, just simple inversions mm -hmm. up the neck in C major. Um, I've been working on that a lot because I'm not great at seeing first inversion uh, up the neck. So Got it. Yeah. Um, thinking about those types of things, right? And I do that for 15. And then the last 15 is like a reward system where I'm thinking about improv creativity. And I let 
kind of my feelings guide me in that maybe I have a sound that I want to use and try to build something. Maybe I got inspired by one of those chord shapes and I want to try to write a little something. But the last 15 is about the the thrust is creativity um, and improvisation versus like, okay, I got to practice this, hit this, hit this. And then I'm done after 45. And that feels manageable. It feels very... Um, like I've accomplished something. I typically accomplish more in that 45 minute practice session than I do on the late night coffee Dorito YouTube watching Bender where I'm <laughs> practicing, you know, for, for four hours yeah, yeah, or something, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah. Um, that is that has been really wonderful. That said, I don't do it as much as I should, but when I do it, it feels like self-care, especially that first 15. It goes from feeling from me feeling like, oh, I'm, this is drudgery, I gotta play the bass, to really not having big expectations of like huge growth. Like, I'm gonna rip through Donna Lee at 220 BPM today, I'm gonna get it down. Mm. It's more like I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. seeing this as a really long arc in my life, and I wanna enjoy the instrument, and I wanna enjoy small gains every day. Uh, and that for me feels good and manageable and really like warm and fuzzy instead of this daunting, oh, dear God, I've got to mm. get all this together by, you know, next week or I'm not a good bass player. Yeah, Man, it's, yeah. it's, it's your whole life. Like if you're in it, it's your whole life. So that's what it is for me. And I'd love to, I would absolutely love to hear what it is for you too, because I, I feel like I could learn something. Well, I, I've got some questions for you. Um, like... I think that, you know, when you were talking about the Doritos, um, the Dorito sessions as well, you know, YouTube Dorito <laughs> sessions. Yeah, yeah. I just want to put it out there as well that I think that those are really valuable or yeah. at least have been for me, you know, putting on a film or whatever or sitting watching the TV and just doing it with the bass. Yes. So, for instance, um, one of my friends um, who teaches down at Leeds College of Music, which is a great music school around where I live, um, I went around his place and all of his bases, and this is a long time ago when we were in our early 20s, I went around his place and all his bases were like under his bed in case. I was, I was like, dude, what are you doing? I was like, get out the base. Yeah. And I just kind of sort of like nailed him with this. Like every time you see, if you're going to watch a film or TV or whatever it is, you've just got to have your base in your hand. Yeah. Just do that, you know. And I'm just, you know, side note, that if anybody's got sort of like a spouse, if you're married out there or something like that, it can be hellishly annoying for them. So <laughs> it's just sort of like... I'm be just sensitive to your... expectations. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But at the time, you know, I was single and I was just sort of like... Sit, I used to sit there and sort of like watch films and stuff like that and just play on my bass and yes. discover stuff. And oh. It was great. Again, like not having any expectations other than because that's like practice comes with expectations of sometimes. course of growth we have right? these progress of growth yes. we must grow we yes. must get progress whereas like sitting watching films uh playing you know whatever you know working out the melodies of the soundtrack of the film or whatever do you know i mean which is what I, I love to do me too um it just didn't come with any expectations at all and and a bunch of weird technique stuff like actually came in those sessions for me like weird when I wasn't really thinking about it. I can remember um, I can play descending scales really fast. Yeah. Like it's just sort of like for whatever reason, um, I think that, you know, some people can do ascending scales really, really fast. But for me, I can actually descend through a scale really fast. I actually did that for the first time, not even thinking about it, watching a film. I was like playing a scale down and, and it just went, I was like, ooh, wow, ooh. that's cool. Yeah. I never kind of worked on it particularly that much. And it was like discovered while I was watching a film. And then after that, I was like leaned into it and was like, okay, can I, you know, can I do it more? Can I do it faster? Can I do it on this area of the finger? Yeah. Whatever it was um, in later days and weeks after that. But I've, I've discovered a bunch of stuff actually just sitting on the, for me, it's not like Doritos and YouTube. For me, it's kind of, well, some of it's just like sitting in this, sitting in my man shed, just yeah. like playing on the bass in the daytime. But it's not, I haven't got a particular intention to do anything. And I think that the point I'm trying to get across is, is that it's really important. You can't just pick up your bass and be super focused and kind of like really intentional all of the time. Because it Absolutely. will just become 
like unfun and crap you know you'll be yeah. like oh you will just it will just be pain you know and i'm not with physical pain i mean like mental pain and kind of which is why and just put it out there you know there is a lot of frustration and pain for you know music students that are in music schools or people that are trying to you know get their musicianship to that next level it is actually quite painful sometimes because yeah. it is a slow burn it's yes, a really it slow burn so i think that it does help to your point to have these just no well not you were talking about meditation within your practice time but just these these times where you sit with the bass with no um real goal in mind other than just to sit with it and just That's, see what happens well and thank i mean thanks for saying it's actually really like edifying for me to hear you say that because you know i sort of feel in a sense pressure to say well when i'm when i'm practicing yes i try to do this 45 minute thing and that is true when i get to it i feel good about it i feel accomplished but most of the time i just like the feeling of the bass in my hands like it feels comfort zone it feels good it feels like a vacation like if i get to sit and turn on a movie and we're all like the families in the room and i i am playing bass quietly to myself ha! it's the best yeah. i mean yeah. it's the best and and i agree with you not having that pressure of expectation of well by the end of this night i'm gonna know you know i'm going to be fluent in whole tone and be able to play out you know jazz solos all over but to just spend time yeah. with the instrument, make a relationship, feel like when you pick it up, it doesn't haunt you. It's not this horrible struggle, but it's nice. Play fun, familiar yeah. things that feel good to play. Because you said the word, yeah. it's supposed to be fun, right? This thing is supposed yeah. to bring you joy. Yeah. Music is supposed to bring you joy. So not thinking about practice um, as this horrific slog being whipped in the woodshed you know i mean yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah, yeah that yeah. needs to come from your own like you then have to have the fire inside of you of like ooh, i really want to get this down so i'm really gonna you know start with the metronome slow and start cranking it up but i really like that you feel that just that time any time spent with the instrument i guess what i'm hearing you say is you feel like maybe time spent with the instrument is quality time absolutely yeah. absolutely just yeah i used to do it i can remember doing it in school i can remember like wandering around i can remember the teacher saying because i played guitar in, in school and she said something like are you glued to that guitar or something like that <laughs> and i actually and i can remember thinking that i can remember thinking yeah i pretty much am glued to this guitar yeah i'm just sort of like you know spent most of my time in the music block at school just playing guitar you know and right. i think that especially when you're a kid I think that if you can get into the groove of just spending time with an instrument, I think that you are just as a byproduct, you're good. You're just going to get better. I mean, like, yes. yes, there are crazy kids that probably practice for hours and their parents are whooping their ass and all of that. I'm yeah. not saying that. Yeah, but that probably definitely exists. Um, but I think there's probably kids that just, you know, absolutely just love fiddling around on, on whatever, on the guitar or the keys or the drums or whatever. And they're probably crushing it without the kind of added mayhem of, you know, I must get better and yes. all of that crap. That yes. When you probably get a little bit older. Because they just like it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, isn't it? For me, um, with my practice, like, as I said before, um, when I was really nailing it in my heyday of practice, which is definitely not now because I've got kids and, you know, like full-time job doing SBL yes. and stuff like that. But in my heyday, um, I used to be really, like I used to sit with my bass all the time doing exactly what we've just been talking about. But when I was practicing, it'd be like super structured and I'd probably try and do around three hours a day. It'd like be that kind of like, you know, for extended periods of time, like a good, you know, maybe like a year, 18 months of practicing sort of like three hours a day. And I was like a full Nazi. I mean, like, you know, timing it. And yes. Sort of like making sure I was practicing all of the stuff and making sure I was like memorizing standards and making sure I could like do all of the stuff. Like just a bit of a maniac about it. Um, but yeah, so that's how my approach, but now with less time, I just try and make sure that I'm really focused on whatever I'm trying to do. Sure. Because I think that if I could go back in time that I would have probably 
decreased the amount of stuff I was focusing on and just said, hey, you know, just focus on, you know, one specific thing, two specific things, and then use that as a as like a frame for practicing other stuff. So for instance, I would probably go back and say, hey, just work on something like all the things you are, because I was into jazz, right? So yeah. just work on all the things you are. Learn all the chords, learn it all over the fingerboard, learn all of the arpeggios, learn all of the scales, learn to improvise, but just all on that one thing. So I was really just going super deep into that one thing. And I think that like I've done that by accident in the past before, and it's been like, whoa, this was amazing because I just wasn't trying to spin, you know, too many plates at the same time. And I learned, like, I just, you know, like, I think learning something in a deep way is, it's really easy to overlook what benefit you get from doing that. You know, about just like going super narrow with, with your focus, but super deep, learning an entire tune in just multiple different ways. And then listening to different artists play it. What did Sonny Rollins sound like when he did it? What did like Coltrane sound like? What did Miles Davis sound? Like, what did Ella sound like, Ella Fitzgerald, when she sang it? Do I mean, like, all of that thing, you know, just sort of, like, getting really deep into it. And I think that that's probably, uh, that's more, like, I do that more now than I used to, but I kind of wish that I'd sort of, like, got that, you know, got more of that in uh, in my practice sessions when I was younger. But uh, here's an interesting question. What do you, if you could re rewind time, what do you feel, if there was one thing you could have practiced more what would it have been? I just so intentional practice about one with, with one. Uh, you know, you I asked because I've got something in mind. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I, I'd love to hear your answer because um, first, let me just back up one second and say something that I love that I feel like I'm hearing you saying is that it's okay to focus on on one thing and go like deep dive into it, like taking all the things you are and going deep and learning how to learning how to walk through that complicated progression. Yeah. Um, learning how to play that head, learning how to solo, learning how to do chord voicings and comp on the bass, listening to different artists. Yeah. I I agree. I did a little bit of that when I was teaching bass at, at this college in Minneapolis. There was a jazz program there and the jazz, you know, the person from that headed up the jazz program, Pete Shu, would be like, dude, you got to get these guys walking chord tones. And I was like, I don't even really know how to. <laughs> you know, so like for me in the beginning, I was in my 20s and I, it, that began this deep dive into that. Um, not as deep as you, yeah, but it. I remember the benefit of really studying one tune. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so boy, I think that's such great advice. Um, the answer that I would give to your question around if I could rewind the clock, I was, um, I wish that I would have asked more questions. I wish that I would have been more open to mentorship or that I, I was such a headstrong little kid that was, you know, like thought I kind of, I thought I was bad, man. And I was playing it and I was playing fast and I bought a six string and, and I always, I had a really actually a, an incredibly negative experience with my first teacher. Um, that, and maybe that might be something, you know, to get into like teachers sometime, but I won't go into it, but I had a really negative experience and I didn't trust what happened. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Did, I was gonna make a really <laughs> bad joke. I was, no, like, I, was gonna, no. I was like, no, he didn't touch you. Did no, he? <laughs> he, he did not. But he um, he had dangled a carrot of slap bass out in front of me for a year. I was thirteen, yeah, and it was in a tiny, tiny little like closet practice space. Oh, at the end, when you get this, you're gonna, I'm gonna teach you this. Da 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 da. And at the end of the year, he was like, okay, I'm gonna teach you this, and he showed me how to play Black Ice by Stu Ham. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a slap thing. And uh, yeah. it's in drop D. He didn't know that. Did you have your kubiki? I didn't have my kubiki. Did you have the time. kubiki? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. But he said, he said uh, here's how it goes. And he played it closed position on D. And I remember, like, it sounded sort of like it, but I remember going home and going, gosh, that first note sounds lower than an E. And I went, dow, and, and tuned my E down and went, <gasps> and I unlocked oh, drop D. I was you third. unlocked the drop D. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I, I remember unlocking the drop D. What an experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and I went back so excited, Scott. I was 13. I went back to my little podunk music store. I was so excited. 
And he said, oh, show me. And I had been working on it. I was going to impress him. I was going to, he was going to be so excited about my discovery. And I said, yeah. I actually found that if you, if you do this and you get these two strings to be the same, that it's actually here and played it for him. And he was furious. Really? Yes. He was furious. He was furious. Huh? He said, oh. Really? Yeah, he goes, oh. He goes like this. Should I be paying you for bass lessons now? And I said, <laughs> what? 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 And he said, oh, you think you're so hot, huh? You think you're so great? Should I be paying you for bass? You, you giving me a bass lesson right now? And I said, no, really? no, 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 no. And he, uh, dude, I'll never forget it, dude. He flung the door of the practice thing open. It had a poster of Billy Sheehan on it. And it, wow, oh, it no. hit the thing. And then the poster of Billy Sheehan fell on the floor. Uh, no. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> he goes, get out of here. Get out of here. Yeah, dude, that was my wow. First <laughs> so them them people exist. Wow, yeah. That's so and, weird. And, you know, over time, I have I have I've really come to terms with that. I mean, in the beginning, I thought it was my fault, right? I felt I even went back and apologized. It's awful. I went back and said, "Oh, I did, I wasn't trying to show off." I, you know, and can I start back up lessons in the fall? And he goes, he went like this. Nah, you're hot enough. This was his response to me. 13. Oh my god! And and, and this so guy. I, yeah, and I now know. I now know nightmare. all about this guy and his family. And he was he was a guitar player that felt confidence issues around the bass guitar. So when there was a he, he maybe didn't even know what drop D was. So when there was a thirteen year old a, kid, and he was a horror of a human being. Yeah, well. let's just yes. get that in there. Yes, <laughs> truly. I mean. Yeah. It was a really yeah. horrible thing to do to a 13, 13 year old kid who, and I was so excited. Yeah, I, I practiced. I wanted. I wanted him to be proud of me. You know, so it was yeah. really hard. And um, but but then I was like, oh, I know who this guy is. Like as I got older, I'm like, ah, this is a this is all from his own issues. This wasn't about me. It was about him. Yeah. You know. But yeah. but what it did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I digress. What it did is it gave me an incredible mistrust, PTSD. distrust, yes, <laughs> yeah, give me around yeah, yeah. educators and education. And, you know, if someone was like, oh, you need to do this thing, I was always like, uh, are you going to yell at me, though? Or, like, what's your agenda? Or, you know, if, if I do it a certain way, are you going to kick me out, right? Because of my my childhood thing. That is thing. awful. That's, yeah, that's awful. That he did that. That's I, I honestly I'm like shocked. I just yeah. can't even imagine anybody doing that to a kid. I know. Yeah. Oh, it was. It was. It was I've awful. got like a little. I've got like an anger thing. Have I told you about it before? I'm <laughs> sort of like I get a little hot under the collar sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, I'm just like, are you getting like hot under the collar right now? Like, yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> oh yeah. I would yeah. love to give that guy a paste in. <laughs> I mean, so you know, so <clears throat> if I if wow. I could turn back the clock, um, I maybe I maybe didn't tell my parents a, a, the extent of how intense it was, or if I did, it kind of was it just sort of got swept under a bit. I wish yeah. that I would have had some someone to process that with, and someone to tell me. This guy is an idiot. You're not the idiot, adolescent Ian Allison. And then I, yeah. I because what happened is then I wasn't asking questions. I was I was happy to do it on my own, right? I was I was gonna just learn all this stuff. And I and then I had some really delightful teacher experiences. I had an amazing lesson with Brian Bromberg later in my life. I had some really great wow. teachers in college, and it and it really opened me up to trying to get over that essentially like a childhood yeah. trauma. Um, yeah, but, yeah. but, uh, I wish, I mean, th that happened and I wish I had better tools sooner in my life to trust education. Again, God, that sounds fucking yeah. sad, <laughs> but it's true. Man, it's, it's bonkers, true. dude. Yeah. No, yeah, it's man. of course. Like, I think that uh, like any, any kid going through something like that, it like, it breaks you a little bit, doesn't it? Like, yeah, it did. I, ha I haven't been through anything like that, but I have been through these sort of like weird experiences where emotionally... You just do not know how to deal with it as a as yes. a child, right? And it's strange. Like I don't know, you know. Like people talk about childhood trauma, and I think that ultimately everybody's got sort of like a bit of you know weird like stuff like this that happens to them. Yeah. It's just yeah. It's but it's it's kind of sad how it it can 
you know, it attaches onto you, doesn't it? It becomes part of the baggage that you, you, that you drag of course. around with you. I mean, I remember in our very first episode, Scott, you talked about that thing. You talked about, ah, how, how like you really struggle with tech and you're not tech savvy. And I was like, I don't see you that way. Yeah. Why do you, and you talked, you were, you were so like gracious and vulnerable to open up about that thing. And um, when there was a teacher who was like, uh oh, you know, divines on the computer or whatever you know divines he's gonna break it, in yeah, yeah, you know yeah. and that you got yeah, this yeah you got sort of typecast as the guy that yeah. was gonna break it or didn't know how to use technology and you just you just yeah. took that <laughs> big heavy knapsack and carried that with you and still are carrying yeah, it in a way so interesting, right isn't it yeah. yes yeah 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 that is so interesting Man. part of my return like, to education is trying to get over like I never want to treat anyone the way I was treated. And I want to do the yeah, opposite. Yeah. I want to encourage if someone if someone does something great, I don't want to feel oh, this thing is, oh no, they're better than I am, or oh no, they're advancing faster than I can keep up with teaching. I want to say, you're amazing. Congratulations. Look at all this progress. You know, that's what Yeah, absolutely. It, and it's yeah. part of me getting over my um, my childhood trauma is like reintegrating yeah. and hopefully providing a good educational experience for people. Um, mm. Yeah. That's maybe why I, I, like I had the opposite, I guess yeah. the opposite experience to that. Yes. Um, in that. So I went on what you, what I heard you say is something like you wish that you'd be more open to mentorship. Yeah. And I actually went and hunted it down like a, like a yes. maniac. Yes. But, and maybe that was because my earliest teachers were really cool, ah, you know, yes. and I didn't, they were just like, like my first teacher, I'm trying to think, like my first teacher was the guy that worked next to my dad in the factory. This guy called Joe Bashushko. His dad was from Belarus, I think. And, mm. um, Yes, yeah, so he worked next to my dad in the factory that my dad worked in, and uh, and, and he played guitar. And he was um, and my and my dad said, "Oh, my son's bought a guitar, and it was I think it cost me like twenty quid or thirty quid, which is like forty dollars or fifty dollars or something. It was almost impossible to play, and as it would do if it cost him like fifty dollars. <laughs> and and I used to go around to Joe's house. My dad used to drive me around, and he used to pay him in cigarettes." That's what he used to like a pack of cigs for, for a lesson. Like it was so old good. school, dude. So great. Pass it, pack of yeah, pack of cigs. Yeah. For um for the uh, for the lesson, and then I'd sit there, and Joe would sort of like chain smoke in this. I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure that people knew about passive smoking yet. I don't know. But and I yeah. used to just like sit in oh, this smoky yeah. room. Yeah. And Joe had this Ibanez guitar, and it was guitar lessons. Obviously, he had this yeah. Ibanez RB something or other. Yeah. And it was bright yellow Sick. he had a four by 12 marshall oh, cab yes. and this digitech 707 i think it was i'm getting yeah i think it was called the digitech 707 and he used to just and he just like introduced me to all of this amazing music he was just yeah. like oh. this this is steve vai i mean like i've been like driving around in the car with my dad and my mom and they're listening to like neil diamond yeah. dr hook and yeah. abba <laughs> yeah, and then yes. suddenly I'm in this dude's house. He's chain smoking and playing me Steve Vai. And oh, he's like passion playing and along. Passionate warfare, man. Passionate, passionate warfare. Wa warfare, dude. <laughs> yes. And he's like playing along with this Marshall cranked oh. on 11, Spinal Tap style. And I'm like, what? It was just in like another world, you know? Yes. And I can remember like he was teaching me this stuff. And then my dad really wanted me to learn classical um, guitar. So I think somebody said, hey, you should get him some classical guitar lessons so he can learn to read music. So at mm -hmm. the same time, I'm having classical guitar lessons from um, from a lady called Pat Robinson, who was a guitar classical guitar teacher that lived up in the town. Amazing. She was like super strict, but yeah. she was cool. You know, yeah, she was yeah. sort of like very kind of like old school, but really cool. Yeah. Learned classical guitar, learned how to, did all the grades and stuff. You, don't, you guys don't have grades, do you? We don't. But like over in Europe, we have like grade one, grade two. Like if you learn any classical instrument, and even like... Um, electric instruments now, like drums or electric guitar or electric bass. There's a grading school, You are going to be doing, oh yeah, big time. I like, feel big so time. out you are, of the loop. Crazy. I didn't know like, that. Yeah, I didn't grade know Grade one, grade two. It's like karate belts, but for, yes. for, for musical instruments. And it's like a big deal over in Europe. Like it's wow. over 200 years old. It is a whole thing. 
so I did my grades on classical guitar and that teacher was great. And man, like I like I went to classical guitar summer school for a week <laughs> That's so down cool. in this place called This is when I had my first drink actually, going all the way back to the top of this interview, <laughs> yeah. me drinking wine. I had my first pint of cider. It was my first drink of alcohol when I was um, I was 13 years old and I went to classical guitar summer school. It was one of the best, uh, not the cider, like the summer school. It was just like a week experience. long. Oh. Man, it was just one of the best experiences of my entire life. It was really scary as well because like yeah. all of these guys are badasses and I'm like 13 and, yeah. you know, and, and, and I've got my own flat. I can remember having like my oh. own little kind of like, um, it was, it, it was, it um, was, They'd rented like an old university or something like that in the summer months, right? So yeah. I was like living in sort of like a in university a dorm. dormitory. Yeah, yeah, but I had my own room and stuff. It was oh. amazing. I can remember, I can remember having this pint of cider. I didn't even know about like getting drunk. That was like I just didn't even know. I had yeah. this pint of cider. I can remember feeling very happy. I was like, <laughs> wow, I'm feeling great. And I did. The, the, the strange thing was, it, I didn't even compute. It didn't even compute. It wasn't like oh. It's because I had cider. Right. Just somebody handed me this cider, and it was in Somerset, and Somerset is notorious for having great cider. Oh, Everybody delicious. drinks cider in Somerset. Yes. Yeah, so they handed me this cider. I drank this pint, and my word, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a happy, happy evening. <laughs> Terrible morning. I had an awful hangover. Yeah. And I was as surprised I was as surprised in the morning with a headache as I was when I went. To, <laughs> yeah, as I was in the, in, in the evening when yeah. I was having a great time. Oh. Yes, yeah, so I went through that. And then the point I was getting to is I tried to get into, I did terrible at school. I was, I just went completely off the rails when I was about 14 years old. Like, wow, just bad. I was like great at school and then just got in the wrong crowd and the, the wrong stuff happened around me and went down a whole bad path, mm -hmm. you know, like real, real bad, mm -hmm. like could have ended up in prison, kind yeah. of like that wasn't robbing people's houses. Wow, but it was real bad. Yeah, it was really bad. Yeah, people I was like hanging around with, sort of like joyriding in cars, and there was like lots of drugs involved, and like you know, three out of my three, like my closest three friends are dead that, uh, oh. that I went to school with. Like it was just sort of like bonkers. Man. Wow, like, it was just I was really, yes. really. It was a really great thing that I got out, got out with unscathed. It was a period of my life from sort of like fourteen, maybe to fourteen to eight. It was like four years, right? Wow. Four four years of just sort of like really bad stuff going on. Yeah, and um, managed to get out of that, but ultimately didn't have any qualifications in school, right? At all, like just didn't do anything. Like ended up just you know couldn't go to university, and I and I didn't want to go to university when I was. 17, 17 or 18, I actually was just a complete mess. But actually, uh, through um, through through just luck, really, um, ended up working as a guitar luthier or a bass luthier. Overwater. Um, and got that, yeah, overwater bass. Yes. Randomly got that job. And it's so good because that was kind of my lifeline out of that really bad situation. Yes. Got a steady job, got a job that I thought, man, I could actually build bases for a living. Because at that time, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. Right. I thought I might end up working in a factory or whatever. I just didn't know. So ended up getting this apprenticeship at Overwater Bases. That pulled me out of that really bad situation and bad group of people I was hanging around with. And... But then, like after two years at Overwater, I was like, I actually want to play bass. Because through working at Overwater, I found bass. Yeah. And then I was like, I actually want to, I want to play bass. I want to be a professional musician. I didn't even know that I could be a professional musician. Met all of these pro bass players through Overwater. I thought, I could do this. Where do I want to go? I'm going to go to music college. Well, I went for the audition. Audition went great. Yeah. And then, um, and then they were like, okay, da, 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 old school. It wasn't digital or anything like that. So they're looking at the papers and stuff like, oh, you haven't got any qualifications. I was like, well, yeah, but, you know, but I can play good. Yeah. And they were like, you just can't get in without any qualifications. Oh. So I couldn't get into music college. So I just thought, well, can I recreate the experience of music college by just finding, like, badasses to study with? It's the beginning of just, SBL, dude. It was the begin. You know dude, what I mean? It was the beginning yeah. of what you created. And just went off. Yeah. And then I, I just took it upon myself. So I moved to a big city, yeah. which is where I live now, actually. Moved to a big city with, you know, there's like 500, 700,000 people live here or something. Moved to a bigger city and then started 
traveling and getting lessons off whoever I could. Yes. All of the best guys. So there was like a really fantastic guitar player who gave me improvisational lessons called Mike Walker. I was traveling out to Barcelona to get lessons from Gary Willis. I was flying over to New York because all of that money was going to go to fund music school, yes. right? That was going to cost thousands. Of course. So I just thought, well, what the hell? I'm just going to spend all of this money going to flying out to Barcelona or over to New York to get lessons. And and ultimately, it cost way less. It didn't so cost, cool. in fact, flights were so cheap. Yeah. Flights from Leeds to Barcelona at the time were £40, so like $60. <laughs> so wow. So I could fly to Barcelona. Yeah. I could fly to Barcelona, um, stay in like a... Um, like an Airbnb style thing, but Airbnb wasn't around then. But stay in sort of like an Airbnb style thing, get a lesson from Gary Willis, come back, practice for a month, all for like, I don't know, 250, like 250, $300. Right. All in. Right. So it was bonkers. So I was just doing that. So I really leaned into getting as many lessons as I could. And I think that, yeah, it, it really paid off. It really paid off because I think that I got just like a great, um, I just sort of like I took a lot of different things from a lot of different people, a lot of different approaches. But actually, the one weird thing that I think that I learned from from the if, if somebody was like, "But what was the one thing yeah. that you learned from?" Because I've studied because because I took that path and went and studied with all of these guys. So like uh, Schooly Saracen. So obviously I, I mentioned him earlier. I went and studied with him in New York and Adam Rogers out in New York, Brad Shepik and Ralph Alessi, fantastic trumpet player and. I've um, got some listen lessons from the, from the drummer called Jim Black, who's sort of like New York City legend. Yeah, heavy. Gary Willis and all of these guys. I just sort of like soaked it up. And the one thing that I kind of took away from it all is that all of them, like the mighty players, the the, the giants that, that I got to sort of like grab a lesson or two from, they didn't have any information that any of the kind of lesser known just like more utilitarian, 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 blah, 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 utilitarian teachers had. All of the guys that were sort of like just teaching in, you know, colleges, music schools, whatever, all of those guys for the most part had the same, the same information. Yeah. In my mind, for whatever reason, well, I think everybody probably thinks this as well, all of the badasses have like different information. Right. Like there's some secret. <laughs> Does that mean? You know, you're going to get a lesson from them and they're going to, they're going to, there's a book <gasps> that has the like pro yeah, the, patterns. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's the pro patterns that only they have. Yeah. And it actually, that was the one thing that I learned from it is that everybody actually is just doing the same thing. Yeah. And they are great players. And because of, whatever because of the time that they put in because of the voice that they have on the instrument because of their journey of being a musician Definitely. and the, the situations that they ended up in and the people that they ended up playing with that's who made them the mu the, like the, the player that they are it wasn't really just the information right. and they certainly didn't have any information that nobody else had right you know they just had all the same information like some of them like conceptually i guess maybe looked at it a little bit differently but it was like it was yeah was that like, disappointing to you in real time were you expecting no oh it wasn't it, no. it was at the opposite it was the opposite yes it was the opposite yeah it was like holy shit these guys aren't special they're just humans right i can do this oh that's that? so cool that's so yeah. cool that you took it to that place and you thought oh there is no secret. There is no magical formula. It's about your perspective. It's about your hard work. It's about, you know. Because um, it could, yeah, to your point, it could go either way, right? Yeah. It could be somebody, some, somebody could be very disappointed. Yeah, you go, oh, I mean? They could be like, oh, I didn't my get word. what I wanted. <laughs> I've, yeah, I didn't get what I wanted. I thought I was going to get something completely different uh, by traveling out to New York than I did from the guy down the street. But the actual reality of it is some of the best lessons I've ever had in my life were like within sort of like a 40 mile radius. Amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. So it's cool, isn't it? So if you're, if you're to someone listening right now, us talking about practice and us talking about, you know, childhood issues. And if, if you <laughs> could um, recommend uh, if someone is going, oh, I feel stuck. I feel, uh, I know that I need to practice. I want to, but I can't seem to get motivated. I can't, 
uh, or like it feels daunting. Do you have um, a tip or a bit of wisdom that you could say, try this to, to get you into that zone? I mean, what would you say? If I said, I'm, I, I'm struggling, I can't do it, how can I do it? I think that I think the key foundational element is that you've got to be inspired. Mm. And if you haven't got that, you're not going to do it. That's so good. Put it back in its case. Don't play base. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you are not inspired, and I think that you've also got to look, like a lot of people, that comment that you've just said um, just earlier, like were you, were you disappointed or were you, um, did you did you find it more inspirational? I found it found it more inspirational. I'm always surprised at the amount of people that get disheartened mm. by the amount of great players. Like I'm always surprised by that because I like because what for whatever reason I don't do that. Yes, it's not natural for me to be like, ooh, there's like a hundred badasses that makes me feel terrible. Even if they're better than me, I mean, I still don't feel terrible. I'm just like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be as good as you. That's like my natural state. I am gonna be as good as that. Yes. So. Oh, that's so I healthy. Think that if anybody, yeah, like I think that it's, I think with a lot of things, your mental approach is really important. So I think that if anybody is in that situation, they do find themselves doing that. I think they've really got to check themselves on it. Like really, really think about like where they're coming from because that is not going to ever have a positive outcome. Ever. That's so true. So, and, and unfortunately, I can't speak to being in that situation. I've never felt like that. So somebody might have a counter argument, but I would still argue back. It's never going to have a good outcome. If you always go to that sort of like scarcity mindset, I mean, they're better than me. Why am I even doing this? I'm never going to be that good. Like, it's really just your own bullshit that you're sort of like, you know, yeah. turning around in your own mind. And it, it just, it, so you, your mental approach to to it's really important, I, I would say. Oh, so true. Stuff. So really, like, get your mental approach right. Make sure that you're getting, you're keeping inspired. Because if your mental approach is right and you're keeping yourself inspired and you're listening to people that inspire you from the, from the point of, oh, man, I want to get some of that into my plane. I want to get some of this into my plane. I, that thing that she's doing over there, I want to get that into it. Yeah. Then you will automatically be like, oh, where's my base? Yes, yes. It, where's my base? It, that is the motivation. Yeah. The inspiration is the motivation. <laughs> it's corny, but exactly, yeah. yeah but yeah. it's so true. I, too, have, have never felt like seeing someone amazing play. I'm like, oh, well, I just got to give it up. <laughs> I have always yeah, felt like... like and I've never felt too like oh seeing seeing a great bass player or a great musician play. I've never felt like oh I need to be as good as they are. I always come at it from an angle of what of that is accessible to me and what can I take into my own thing, you know, to make Got me it, yeah. who I am instead of feeling like oh I'll never be able to be Victor Wooten. Well, of course, that's preposterous. But what of yeah, Victor yeah. Wooten's thing? can I put into my thing and make uh, like a, a cool hybrid of all of the people that I'm really inspired by? I wanted to add yeah. one thing to your, um, the inspiration thing is, is so clutch. I think it's perfect. The one thing I want to add is, and you don't always have to be inspired by things that you would think you would have to be inspired by. For instance, it doesn't okay, have yeah. to be jazz. It doesn't even have to be music. What inspires you? Do you need to take a walk in the woods? What inspires you? Yeah. Do you need to watch a film that you've always wanted to watch and have your bass in hand? What is it that is, that is yeah. inspirational to you? Do that and then see if that can come back to your playing in a way like getting perspective and not thinking well everyone tells me that i need to be listening to coltrane and the new john mayer record and that you know if you yeah, want to do yeah. those things do those things but also if you're like boy what would be amazing is taking my instrument out into the woods by a stream plugging in my little battery powered headphone thing and just playing in front of the river like it doesn't matter how you get inspired wouldn't you say scott it's just matters yeah, that 100%. you are inspired and then to be okay with the thing that inspires you <laughs> to be to not feel like oh this inspiration isn't real inspiration you know to not compare yourself to other people but to say 
wow, I'm feeling really inspired and have that be good and enough. The thing that inspires you, if it's really true for you, will give you your own thing. It'll help you find your voice. Absolutely. And, and you've got to be proactive about it as well. I mean, like, you've got to be, you've, like, you've got to be, you've just got to be proactive. You can't, like, there's so many people, sorry to like, the broad brushstroke, there's so many people, it sounds like, <laughs> like, but there is, right? Yeah, I just is. get, no, there's a lot of people just sitting, waiting for the thing to happen. Mm. And, and it's just, what happens if it's actually just never going to happen? So I just, like, I just really, really, again just recommend that people are proactive around it you don't it's not gonna it might not happen you know what i mean you actually have to go and make it happen like you need to it make might the not time be perfect even. yeah you gotta make the time you gotta make the time and to take gotta, the walk yeah and to watch the movie and, or to put on the record or turn on spotify and yes yeah and you can do like i'm trying to like for, for, for like mental you know i guess sort of like mental approaches or mental attitude the way that you think your own psychology and stuff like that there's like stuff you can do about that as well you know like maybe it's if if you are a player who finds it hard to 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 see other people doing great mm. and playing really great if if, if that is you it still doesn't mean that that has to be you. You can be like, oh, this is a problem, mm. you know, and I, identifying it. What, like, why do I go to that naturally? What is that? And what, what can I do about it? And I'm not sure what you can do about it, but I would, if it was me in that situation, I would love to, I would love to think that I would be thinking about proactive ways of changing my own psychology around yes. that, whether it be listening to sort of like, you know, I don't know, like self development, whatever. Do you know what I mean like podcasts or? getting a little bit into that like i'm really into that on the business side i'm heavily into yeah that. like i'm really really into sort of like listening to like self-development uh, like how i'm thinking about things the way i approach things um because i think that um, a lot of the problem is it's it's how you're thinking about it. the problem isn't the problem the problem is how you're thinking the headspace so makes sense yeah Absolutely. it's how you actually how you're thinking about the problem that is the actual the crux of it so yeah so just like if anybody's listened to it listen to this and they're just thinking i'd love to feel like that and be inspired by great players and not actually feel you know the opposite feel put off by it there is stuff you can do but you know for, you can you can do stuff about and it. you know one of those right. things right. is listen to the scott and ian podcast <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Yeah. I mean, I feel like we're I feel like we're digging into real life. You know, sometimes we we put up this list of things of of topics of like, well, it, and it always I feel like it always ends up we always end up get going deep <laughs> and talking about life yeah. and talking about uh, yeah. you know childhood stuff and talking about our own um, you know our own uh, failures and foibles, right? So I I think too if. If this podcast is speaking to you, go back and listen uh, to, to previous episodes if you haven't, because there's some great nuggets in there from Scott um, and from me just around like the, the struggles that we've come through, uh, how we've addressed certain things. And, and it's fun to hear, especially if someone, if you're a bass player listening to this or a musician, it's fun to hear people that are on this journey who have had these experiences how they've dealt with these experiences right like like-minded people yeah. people in the industry or that love your craft how they've dealt with these with hardships um or with success or you know all of these all of these life issues it's more than just music scott divine we're talking about more than music it's here the music's the icing, dude. It's the cake. That, it's the, you know what I mean? It's sort of like it's the, the cake underneath that we're delving into, it, isn't it? It's sort of like it's the it's the fabric of, of what makes things go. But it's, it's wildly interesting, isn't it? It is wildly interesting. I could talk about that shit. Me too. Like after last week's podcast, actually, I went over to the house. I was like, whoa, Lisa just had a great conversation with Ian. I was like, it was amazing. She was like, what do you mean? And I was like, it's really rare to sit down with somebody yeah. and just talk about like a topic one topic for an extended period of time you just never do never it really do it. it's I just know. like do you know I mean you never do it you see your mates on gigs and stuff and you'll sort of hey, like, how you hey, doing? what are you doing doing this yeah. that, and the other you're not going to sit down with them and be like <laughs> okay let's talk about this thing 
for like an hour and a half, you know, and it's really, it's almost sort of like a process of self discovery. Or, or that's what I've found. I agree. Like through many of the, many of these conversations, because I think that it's given me the space to think about how I actually, you know, what I actually think about Cause sometimes we don't think about what we actually think. We're just kind of sort of like, you know, bumbling through life, yes. hoping that things are going to be okay. <laughs> hold, you know, we're holding together with sort of like, yeah, <laughs> just sort of like, it's kind of the same for everybody. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's just great to just sort of like sit back and reflect and, and yeah, hopefully obviously everybody is uh, getting something from this as well. And, and hopefully some, everybody's getting something from, I guess, like the, uh, the authenticity of it as well, because I think that, you know, you can probably tell that Ian and I aren't holding anything back and we're just sort of like, you know, kind of sort of like letting it hang. Yeah. Scott's <laughs> so, like, Scott's like oh, yeah. tell, tell the story of your childhood trauma. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> but I mean, it I is, know. it's, I, I do think, I hope, I hope that it is helpful. And I mean, I hope that it uh, engages a discussion too. I mean, um, either, either in the campus on SBL um, or people, yeah. people DM me. I, I know they're DMing you too about the comments, and I read all of it, you guys. So if you wanna, if you wanna send me a message or send Scott a message uh, and tell us how you're liking the podcast, we'd love to hear your feedback. We want to make the show absolutely, great. and leave a review on iTunes. Ooh, and yeah. it is going on Spotify. I spoke to Phil. Hell yeah, hey, Phil, if you're listening. Phil said he was loving the podcast. Oh, so good. To say hello. What's up, hey, Phil? Phil? We love you. Phil, you're the best. Uh, Phil's <laughs> director of ops. He, he holds the SBL ship together. But he was saying that the, the problem with Spotify is that some of the older SBL interviews have got, like, copyrighted music on them. Oh. So, and, like, Spotify has got this sort of, like, three copyright strikes and you're out thing. Oh. So they are not sure if they can take the entire sbl podcast catalog over to spotify but at the very least what we'll do is we'll leave because there's obviously all, like loads of other interviews on there in fact we released one today i think i think i spotted did one. we um that's yeah a and somebody yeah um that's a, it's a problem isn't it we publish a lot of <laughs> stuff, a lot of stuff. Like, yes we released a course yesterday from nick, nick campbell. campbell dude i cannot wait i am so excited because i've always wanted to know about that pentatonic thing like that out soloing jazz yeah. vocabulary with pentatonics i'm diving in maybe even after this i might dive in for a minute and check it out dude he's he's great yeah. he's great he's also great on camera he's a great teacher he's, great he's teacher fun. on camera yeah yeah just great vibe if anybody wants to check out nick campbell you'll find him on um instagram what's his his name is nick like campbell a... destroys on instagram oh yeah nick campbell destroys yep and he does destroy on bass just to put it out there he's, um, he's funny, so killer man. he's he's yeah and he's just me, released too. he's amazing yeah. isn't he? he's just released a brand new course on sbl um talking about pentatonic voice leading and superimposition so like putting like superimposing pentatonic scales on top of each other to get cool sounds and uh, it is really really great it's really great really great and shout out to matty actually as well who recorded that over in because uh, matty one of the videographers that's on the spl team lives out in la and he went around to nick's place to get that course filmed so yeah really great I was going to say something else. I can't remember what it was. I just like Nick Campbell just popped into my mind. I, I just kind of you're talking oh, yeah, podcast. Yeah, the, the Spotify. Yeah. I was going to say that you know if we can't get the rest of the po the the SPL podcast on Spotify, we'll just have our episodes on Spotify yeah. anyway. Yeah. So that'll be happening over the next couple of weeks. So yeah, fingers crossed that'll be all all um, all sorted. Anyway, dude, dude, should we call yeah. it? Let's do it. Been good. It's been, it's been so emotional. Good. It has. As always. <laughs> Take it easy, guys. We will see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye.